How to Succeed or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune by Arison Sweat Marden. Chapter 4. Out of Place. The high prize of life, the crowning fortune of a man, is to be born with a bias to some pursuit, which finds him in employment and happiness. Emerson. The art of putting the right man in the right place is perhaps the first in the science of government, but the art of finding a satisfactory position for the discontented is the most difficult. Talleyrand. It is a celebrated thought of Socrates, that if all the misfortunes of mankind were cast into a public stock in order to be equally distributed among the whole species, those who now think themselves the most unhappy would prefer the share they are already possessed of before that which would fall to them by such a division. Addison I was born to other things. Tennyson How many a rustic Milton has passed by, stifling the speechless longings of his heart, in unremitting drudgery and care, how many a vulgar Cato has compelled his energies no longer tameless then, to mold a pin or fabricate a nail. Shelley But I'm good for something, pleaded a young man whom a merchant was about to discharge for his bluntness. You are good for nothing as a salesman, said his employer. I am sure I can be useful, said the youth. How? Tell me how. I don't know, sir, I, I don't know. Nor do I, said the merchant, laughing at the earnestness of his clerk. Only don't put me away, sir, don't put me away. Try me at something besides selling. I cannot sell, I know I cannot sell. I know that too, said the principal. That is what's wrong. But I can make myself useful somehow, persisted the young man. I know I can. He was placed in the counting-house, where his aptitude for figures soon showed itself, and in a few years he became not only chief cashier in the large store, but an eminent accountant. Out of an art, says Bulwer, a man may be so trivial you would mistake him for an imbecile, at best a grown infant. Put him into his art, and how high he soars above you! How quietly he enters into a heaven of which he has become a denizen! and unlocking the gates with his golden key, admits you to follow, an humble reverend visitor. A man out of place is like a fish out of water. Its fins mean nothing, they are only a hindrance. The fish can do nothing but flounder out of its element, but as soon as the fins feel the water, they mean something. Fifty-two percent of our college graduates studied law, not because in many cases they have the slightest natural aptitude for it, but because it is put down as the proper road to promotion. A man never grows in personal power and moral stamina when out of his place. If he grows at all, it is a narrow, one-sided, stunted growth, not a manly growth. Nature abhors the slightest perversion of natural aptitude or deviation from the sealed orders which accompany every soul into this world. A man out of place is not half a man. He feels unmanned, unsexed, he cannot respect himself, hence he cannot be respected. You can enter all kinds of horses for a race, but only those which have natural adaptation for speed will make records. The others will only make themselves ridiculous by their lumbering, unnatural exertions to win. How many truck and family horse lawyers make themselves ridiculous by trying to speed on the law track, where courts and juries only laugh at them? The effort to redeem themselves from scorn may enable them, by unnatural exertions, to become fairly passable, but the same efforts along the line of their strength or adaptation would make them kings in their line. Jonathan, said Mr. Chase, when his son told of having nearly fitted himself for college, thou shalt go down to the machine shop on Monday morning. It was many years before Jonathan escaped from the shop to work his way up to the position of a man of great influence as a United States Senator from Rhode Island. Galileo was sent to the university at Pisa at 17 with the strict injunction not to neglect medical subjects for the alluring study of philosophy or literature. But when he was 18, he discovered the great principle of the pendulum by a lamp left swinging in the cathedral. John Adams' father was a shoemaker, and trying to teach his son the art, gave him some uppers to cut out by a pattern which had a three-cornered hole in it to hang it up by. The future statesman followed the pattern, hole and all. There is a tradition that Tennyson's first poems were published at the instigation of his father's coachman. 
His grandfather gave the lad ten shillings for writing an elegy on his grandmother. As he handed it to him, he said, There, that's the first money you ever earned by your poetry, and take my word for it, it will be the last. Murillo's mother had marked her boy for a priest, but nature had already laid her hand upon him and marked him for her own. His mother was shocked on returning from church one day to find that the child had taken down the sacred family picture, Jesus and the Lamb, and had painted his own hat on the Savior's head and had changed the lamb into a dog. The poor boy's home was broken up, and he started out on foot and alone to seek his fortune. All he had was courage and determination to make something of himself. He not only became a famous artist, but a man of great character. Let us people who are so uncommonly clever and learned, says Thackeray, have a great tenderness and pity for the folks who are not endowed with the prodigious talents which we have. I have always had a regard for dunces. Those of my own school days were among the pleasantest of the fellows, and have turned out by no means the dullest in life. Whereas, many a youth who could turn off Latin hexameters by the yard and construe Greek quite glibly, is no better than a feeble prig now, with not a penny worth more brains than were in his head before his beard grew. In the winter of 1824, there set in a great flood upon the town of Sidmouth. The tide rose to a terrible height. In the midst of this sublime and terrible storm, Dame Partington, who lived upon the beach, was seen at the door of her house with mop and pattens, trundling her mop, squeezing out the sea water, and vigorously pushing away the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic was roused. Mrs. Partington's spirit was up, but I need not tell you the contest was unequal. The Atlantic Ocean beat Mrs. Partington. She was excellent as a slop or a puddle, but she should not have meddled with a tempest. How many Dame Partingtons there are, of both sexes, and in every walk of life! The young swan is restless and uneasy until she finds the element she has never before seen. Then, with arched neck between her white wings mantling proudly, rose her state with oary feet. What a wretched failure was that of Hayden the painter! He thought he failed through the world's ingratitude or injustice, but his failure was due wholly to his being out of place. His bitter disappointments at his half-successes were really pitiable, because to him they were more than failures. He had not the slightest sense of color, yet went through life under the delusion that he was an artist. If it is God's will to take any of my children by death, I hope it may be Isaac, said the father of Dr. Isaac Barrow. Why do you tell that blockhead the same thing twenty times over? asked John Wesley's father. Because, replied his mother, if I had told him but nineteen times, all my labor would have been lost, while now he will understand and remember. A man out of place may manage to get a living, but he has lost the buoyancy, energy, and enthusiasm which are as natural to a man in his place as his breath. He is industrious, but he works mechanically and without heart. It is to support himself and family, not because he cannot help it. Dinner time does not come two hours before he realizes it. A man out of place is constantly looking at his watch and thinking of his salary. If a man is in his place, he is happy, joyous, cheerful, energetic, fertile in resources. The days are too short for him. All his faculties give their consent to his work, say yes to his occupation. He is a man. He respects himself and is happy because all his powers are at play in their natural sphere. There is no compromising of his faculties, no cramping of legal acumen upon the farm, no suppressing of forensic oratorical powers at the shoemaker's bench, no stifling of exuberance of physical strength, of visions of golden crops and blooded cattle amid the loved country life in the dry clergyman's study, composing sermons to put the congregation to sleep. To be out of place is demoralizing to all the powers of manhood. We can't cheat nature out of her aim. If she has set all the currents of your life toward medicine or law, you will only be a botch at anything else. Willpower and application cannot make a farmer of a born painter any more than a lumbering draft horse can be changed into a racehorse. When the powers are not used along the line of their strength, they become demoralized, weakened, deteriorated. Self-respect, enthusiasm, and courage ooze out. 
we become half-hearted and success is impossible. Scott was called the great blockhead while in Edinburgh College. Grant's mother called the future general and president useless Grant because he was so unhandy and dull. Erskine had at length found his place as a lawyer. He carried everything before him at the bar. Had he remained in the Navy, he would probably never have been heard from. When elected to Parliament, his lofty spirit was chilled by the cold sarcasm and contemptuous indifference of Pitt, whom he was expected by his friends to annihilate. But he was again out of his place. He was shorn of his magic power, and his eloquent tongue faltered from a consciousness of being out of his place. Gould failed as a storekeeper, tanner and surveyor, and civil engineer, before he got into a railroad office where he struck his gate. When extracts from James Russell Lowell's poem at Harvard were shown his father at Rome, instead of being pleased, the latter said, James promised me when I left home that he would give up poetry and stick to books. I had hoped that he had become less flighty. The world is full of people at war with their positions. Man only grows when he is developing along the lines of his own individuality, and not when he is trying to be somebody else. All attempts to imitate another man, when there is no one like you in all creation, as the pattern was broken when you were born, is not only to ruin your own pattern, but to make only an echo of the one imitated. There is no strength off the lines of our own individuality. Anywhere else we are dwarfs, weaklings, echoes, and the echo even of a great man is a sorry contrast to even the smallest human being who is himself. End of chapter 4 Recording by Lee Smalley